Hi, everyone. Before we get into today's episode, we are thrilled to have AMBOSS as our sponsor for the episode. Let's hear from James, an internal medicine resident in the Bay Area, and how he uses AMBOSS. We had a patient with hyponatremia, and you know we were monitoring their sodium with free water restriction, and it looked like they were overcorrecting. Like, oh, what am I supposed to do at this point in time? What's the second line? What's the third line? What are possible options for management? The fact that as an intern, AMBOSS provided you with the amount of information at a very accessible, quick, and digestible format, I think that was something that was really helpful for the workflow. And there's many other tools that might fulfill that, but I felt like it worked well for me. I think the biggest thing was the search bar function and then that very stable format of how they broke down that knowledge. I think that's a really big differentiating feature about AMBOSS. And Coriam listeners can get a one-month free trial using the code Coriam-AMBOSS. We'll link all that in the show notes for you. Also, this episode will count for a CME credit with the American College of Physicians. Click on the link in the show notes, answer three questions, and get CME credit. And with that, cue the intro. People often tell me, oh, I didn't want to use that rescue inhaler because that's for emergencies only. So I tell people it's called a rescue inhaler because it works right away, not because you have to be dying to take it. And you can take it three, four times a day if you want. That's Dr. Kai Sakinen, a pulmonologist at Mass General Hospital. And today we are going to unpack inhalers and all things COPD. Welcome to the Core I Am Five Pearls podcast, bringing you high yield evidence based pearls. I'm Dr. Shreya Trivedi, an internist at BIDMC. I'm Allie Trainer, a pulmonary and critical care fellow at the Harvard Combined Program at MGH and BIDMC. And I'm Luke Hedrick, an internal medicine resident at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. On today's Five Pearl episode, we're going to be taking a longitudinal view of COPD, from the first time you meet the patient to end-of-life care. Let's get started with the pearls we'll be covering in this episode. Test yourself by pausing after each of the five questions. Remember, the more you test yourself, the deeper your learning gains. Pearl number one, diagnosis and empiric therapy. How many patients carry a COPD label without an appropriate diagnosis, and what's the role of empiric therapy? Pearl number two, the initial visit, blood work, and initial treatment choices. What blood work should all COPD patients have done at least once, and what should guide your initial choice of medications? Pearl number three, inhaler devices. What are the three different types of inhaler devices, and what should you educate patients about each? Pearl number four, inhaled steroids and inhaler escalation. When do you stop the inhaled steroid in COPD? And when do you think of increasing the dose? Pearl number five, communication, palliative care, and end-of-life care in COPD. What's important to communicate at the time of diagnosis and during goals of care discussions? So let's start with a case we've all met. You've got a middle-aged patient who smoked for 10 years or so in the past. They've got a cough, some dyspnea on exertion. So they get empirically diagnosed with COPD and given some inhalers. I do see a fair number of people who have been labeled with COPD. um, And and as you said, it's not really clear that that's what their diagnosis is. I think it's tempting to label someone as having COPD if they have respiratory symptoms and they have a smoking history. What really surprised me while working on this episode was just how common this actually is. Depending on the study you look at, about 33% of patients get labeled with COPD without ever having spirometry. Yikes. You know, that's interesting because especially if we go back to what we need to actually diagnose COPD, we need two things, right? One, symptoms like dyspnea, sputum production, wheezing. And two, we need airflow obstruction on spirometry without any alternate explanation. Just a quick point, too, on the obstruction on PFTs. We're used to using FEV1 to FVC ratio of less than 0.7 as a cutoff, but there's actually new guidelines out that instead we should be using the fifth percentile or lower limit of normal because it might actually better address systemic misinterpretation for women, children, and older adults. That's really neat. I'm so glad we're redefining cutoffs based on what might be normal for different types of people. That's awesome. So 
For those patients who actually do end up getting spirometry with that COPD label, I'm curious, how many of them actually have obstruction on their PFTs? One study I was looking into found only 62% of patients labeled and even treated for COPD actually had obstruction on their PFTs. Wow. So one in three people were getting treated for something they didn't have? You know, I'm actually not too surprised by that number. I feel like I've seen a decent amount of patients with an impressive smoking history who actually end up having no evidence of COPD. What's wild to me is that some studies found even after the spirometry didn't show obstruction, one in four patients were still getting treated for COPD a year and a half later. Uh, that is a long time to be on daily inhalers for something, again, that they don't have. Not only that, but it actually really worries me that we could be treating someone for COPD that they don't even have, and then there could be something else that's really concerning that we're missing. Maybe they'll have some other smoking-related lung disease, respiratory bronchiolitis, interstitial lung disease, or Langerhans cell histiocytosis, or maybe they'll have congestive heart failure, or maybe they'll have lung cancer, or maybe they'll have something completely unrelated. There are days when it seems like everyone has reflux until proven otherwise, uh, which can often uh, contribute to cough, and wheezing. And if they are refluxing and actually regurgitating and aspirating, that can certainly contribute to respiratory problems. There are other days when it seems like everyone has oral pharyngeal aspiration until proven otherwise. So especially as people get older, things don't work the way they used to. Yeah, I feel a lot of what we do in pulmonary clinic is helping to say it's not the lungs that are causing the dyspnea. Oh, that is a, a tough job. I do not <laughs> mean that. <laughs> okay, so help me out, guys. How do we go about them? All the patients that come in with this COPD label, they don't have spirometry. Should we not be starting empiric COPD inhalers? I think it uh, makes a little bit of a difference um, what the clinical situation is at the time with the patient. If you're seeing somebody in the emergency room or in the hospital who um, is having some kind of acute respiratory crisis, you treat for what you think is going on. You can treat empirically and you, you know, worry about the details later. But it is really important to, um, to try to nail down the diagnosis. Yeah, so I would think of this the same way that you would a presumed heart failure exacerbation, which is that if someone has never had a cardiac workup, but their presentation to the hospital really seems consistent with a CHF exacerbation, then of course you're going to treat them with diuretics, but you would never empirically start them on a beta blockers or an ACE inhibitor without first getting an echo. So I think similarly with presumed COPD, yes, go ahead, treat them empirically in the acute setting, but I would be really cautious about continuing maintenance inhalers without getting spirometry. You know, one piece of nuance that one of our peer reviewers, Dr. Jaime Betancourt pointed out, is that so many inpatients end up getting a chest CT for one reason or another and you might see radiographic evidence of emphysema on that scan. In that case, symptoms that sound like COPD and imaging evidence of it, it's probably okay to start maintenance inhalers and just order outpatient PFTs for confirmation. I'm glad you brought that up. That comes up all the time. Maybe this is a good time to recap Pearl 1. So while it is okay to treat an acute respiratory issue empirically as COPD, make sure you do your due diligence the next time you see someone with COPD in their one-liner who's on maintenance therapy, and who's never had spirometry. Advocate for them to get PFTs. It can really clarify if obstruction is what's actually causing their symptoms. We finally get our patient to get PFTs, and there is, in fact, evidence of obstruction. We rule out other conditions that can cause obstruction. What are next steps? Well, so now we have to get some blood work, too. Wait, blood work? <laughs> That's definitely not something I'm jumping to in COPD. Yeah. So one that I actually learned recently is that you should actually check everyone with COPD once for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency because it's something that we can treat and we treat it differently. Yeah. This is something I'm definitely not routinely doing or chart reviewing if it's been done in the past. Mm -hmm. And the one that people do seem to think of more commonly is to check a CBC with differential at least once to look at the eosinophil count. Eos? I'm kind of surprised by that one too. What's the thinking behind looking into the eosinophils in COPD? But the movement in COPD in terms of treatment now is much more linked to phenotypes. You know, so are you a frequent exacerbator? Do you have high eosinophil levels? Or do you have an asthma COPD overlap syndrome? These are all sort of clinical phenotypes that are probably dictating therapy a little bit more. 
That's Dr. Rich Schwartzstein, Chief of the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at BIDMC and professor at Harvard Medical School. The idea here being that people with a higher eosinophil count might have an allergic or inflammatory phenotype. And so then the inhaled corticosteroid, which we'll refer to as an ICS, will directly treat this and therefore should reduce their exacerbations. That sounds really nice. Why isn't everyone on an ICS? Well, so if you don't have the high eosinophils, then they don't have an inflammatory phenotype. So then the ICS will really just result in immunosuppression and can increase their risk of pneumonia. Ah, the good old weighing risks and benefits Mm -hmm. rears its head again. Okay, so it sounds like with inhaled steroids, we should be cautious and only use it if we can in the inflammatory phenotypes. So what sorts of eosinophil values should we be looking out for that can clue us, oh, this person is more of an inflammatory phenotype? Yeah, so exact values differ between studies and individual practice patterns do vary. Some people use a threshold of 300 or 400, but there is evidence that peripheral eosinophils greater than 100 cells per microliter predicts a patient's risk of exacerbation and that they will likely respond to an inhaled steroid. And if the EOs are less than 100, the patient may have a higher rate of pneumonia with that inhaled steroid. A pro tip to keep in mind here too is you want to make sure that you're not checking the EOs when your patient is on systemic steroids because that's just going to make their EOs go down and it could mask what their true eosinophil level is. Ah, that is a good one to remember. Okay, so we've ordered the blood work. Now, how should we think about treatment? There are so many different inhaler options. It's kind of overwhelming. Yeah, totally. You know, I think it's so much easier once you realize that there are actually only three classes of medications. You have beta agonists, muscarinic antagonists, corticosteroids, and that is it. So when we're talking about initial therapy inhalers, all you have to do is remember those three drug classes. Again, beta agonists, muscarinic antagonists, and corticosteroids. That does help simplify things. And I think the other thing that I found myself a bit fuzzy about is which ones are are which. And and that was until I made the connection that all the long-acting muscarinic antagonists or the LAMAs, all those inhalers end with IUM. So this is going to be the teotropiums, the aclidinium, the umeclidinium. And then all the inhaled steroids, for example, are going to end with O-N-E. So the fluticasone, the beclomethasone. And the last one is going to be the long-acting beta agonists. These are going to be the ones that end with O-L. Some examples of LAMAs are going to be fometerol, semeterol, all the alls. <laughs> <laughs> My neurotic brain finds it really reassuring that there's a, a method to the madness of drug names that it actually means Preach. something. I know. <laughs> if only all, all meds could be like that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's move on to which patients get which combination of those three types of meds. So to do that, you're first going to have to stage your patient and you'll go to the gold staging. And the long and short of this is that patients are given a grade, which is defined by their FEV1 and also informs their prognosis. And then they're also given a group, which informs the initial inhaler choice. Right. So if you can take a look at the awesome two by two table by gold, we'll link that in our show notes, but it basically categorizes patients into either group A, B, C, or D based on the number and severity of exacerbations in the last year and symptom burden. And to quantify their symptom burden, it may be tempting to use the MMRC, which is one of the two tools that Gold recommends, since it's only one question asking at what level of exertion someone feels dystonic. But this actually leads to understaging and then undertreating because patients often downplay their shortness of breath. Exactly. And, you know, again, it can be helpful to look at this two by two table to guide you, but in practice, it's actually pretty simple. So if your patient has not been hospitalized in the last year, they're in group A or B, and you're going to be starting with only one inhaled medication. And this can either be a beta agonist or a muscarinic antagonist. Yeah, that's because both LABAs and LAMAs are good meds. They've both been shown to improve lung function, shortness of breath, and exacerbation rates. So you could reach for either one of them for patients in group A or B. But then we jump up to group C, and so these people have had one or more exacerbations leading to a hospitalization. And so for those people, Llamas were actually more effective than LABAs for reducing exacerbation, so LAMAs are recommended in group C patients. Ah, guys, this is great, but I'm hearing lots of LAMAs and LABAs, and I, I know there are only two different medications, as Ali pointed out, but it seems like there's still a lot of variability in terms of what you can do. Great point. That's so true. But what you'll notice is that LAMAs are an option as initial therapy for all three of these groups, groups A, B, and C. So Personally, to make my life easy, I almost always prescribe a llama as initial therapy for any of these patients. That does make things a bit simpler. Go for the llama. What about group D? What's your thinking there? Group D is your patients who have the highest symptom burden and frequent or severe exacerbations. 
for these patients, you're going to want to start with a combination of two inhaled meds. And bringing it back to our earlier point, these group D patients, if they have high eosinophils, you can choose a LABA with an ICS. But if they don't have high eosinophils, then you'll want to start with a LAMA LABA. All right. Things are clicking more. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why don't we summarize here? Luke, why don't you take a shot? Definitely. So when you're first seeing a COPD patient, make sure to screen for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency once, especially in a young person or someone without a significant smoking history. And check their eosinophils, especially when they're not on steroids. The initial choice of inhalers is based on which gold group they fall into, and that group is determined by the number and severity of exacerbations in the last year and their symptom burden. All right, and then summarizing the initial inhaler option section, what I've learned is that you can prescribe LAMA as the initial therapy for any of these groups, which is great, and thank you, Ali, for simplifying that. For group D, you usually prescribe a combination of either LAMA, LABA, and then if they're the high EO or more inflammatory kind of asthma COPD phenotype, we're going to reach for the LABA inhaled steroid combo. So now we've decided on the initial meds we want to prescribe our patient. You open up the medical record to write the prescriptions and suddenly a wall of words like handy hailer, discus, ellipta, MDI, respimad, and respiclick start filling the screen. Ugh. Oh my gosh. I feel like I've actually woken up and this is probably like weird to admit, my mind was like clicking through this exact section of the screen, like having like sweats and just feeling lost. But what's the right inhaler device to click? I've honestly just been tempted to just like choose the first inhaler device. I'm like, oh, it's the same drug. Like, but guys, kind of think of it. Does the device choice matter? Is one inhaler device more superior than the other when it comes to COPD outcomes? Not really. I was surprised to learn that studies have not identified any single device or delivery method to give superior disease control. Yeah, on a population level, there really doesn't seem to be any difference, but it's an entirely different story when you're talking about the individual patient in front of you and which device will work best for them. I think the biggest mistake that we make is we give them the inhaler, we sort of tell them how to use it, but we don't actually watch them use it. We don't you know, critique them and, and help them with that. And what frustrates me is that we know that a lot of our patients struggle to use their inhalers. And despite that, rates of proper use haven't gotten any better over the last half century. I do ask patients to demonstrate how they take their inhaler. And sometimes they'll tell you, Doc, I've been doing this for years. I know what I'm doing. And so then, and then they demonstrate completely the wrong technique. So they will be exhaling while the mist is coming out of the device. And you can see the mist floating up around their face as they exhale. So then I say, well, let me give you a few pointers. So, and I explain why and how to do it. And I've had people who, once you show them and explain to them how it's supposed to be done, they come back and say, you know what, that stuff really works. Dr. Salkinen also had one other practical tip that I want to make sure we share with the listeners as this applies to all inhaler devices. You squeeze, then breathe, and then hold your breath for a good five or 10 seconds. And the reason you're holding your breath is so that the mist settles down and sticks to the walls of the airway. So then it gets absorbed. If you if you just inhale and exhale, then the medicine goes in and goes out and doesn't do anybody any good. So I have some patients in my clinic who are like, um, you want me to hold my breath for 10 seconds? Good <laughs> joke. <laughs> but you know, I think it's still good for them to know so that they can do the best that they can. Yep. yep, That's my motto. Something is better than nothing. (laughs) So (laughs) we'll take it. We'll take it. All right. Why don't we delve into the different inhaler device types and what should we be educating our patients on for each of them? Yeah. You know, as a first year fellow, my program actually had a pharmacist come do a demonstration of all the different inhalers for us. And I was surprised by just how many different delivery systems there are and how confusing they are. And honestly, I had no idea how to use half of them. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that makes me feel a little bit better about like the sweats I get when I look at that inhaler device page. So thank you for making me feel a little less alone in this. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> All right. So there are three big buckets of inhalers. The first are pressurized metered dose inhalers or PMDIs. Generally speaking, if a med you're prescribing has HFA after it, there's a good chance it's a PMDI. Oh yeah. I've definitely seen a lot of that HFA language before and To be honest, I didn't know what that exactly meant, and I didn't know they were linked to the pressurized meter dose inhalers. Yeah, it stands for hydrofluoroalkane, which is just a propellant that a lot of these use. An advantage of these is familiarity. Even though TV and movies will show them being used wrong most of the time, this is what your patient is going to think of when you tell them that they need an inhaler. When we're counseling our patients using PMDIs, we need to make sure that they shake the inhaler before each dose to ensure they're getting a consistent dose. And 
if they haven't used it in a few days, remind them that they'll need to prime it by pumping a couple of times before they use it to make sure that the dose is consistent. Okay, so good to know. I'm curious, guys, what are some of the cons with PMDIs? Well, with the PMDIs, one of the challenges is that the patient has to coordinate pressing down on the canister and inhaling at the same time. And unfortunately, if they don't do this, a lot of the drug can stay in their oropharynx and not get into their lungs, which, you know, wastes the dose of the drug, but it can also cause side effects like funny taste or throat irritation. Yeah. And for this reason, PMDIs are often given with a separate prescription for a spacer or holding chamber. Spacers are basically just a big reservoir that you add on to the end of a pressurized meter dose inhaler. And then a valve holding chamber is basically just a spacer with a one-way valve inside. Spacers and holding chambers. You know, I think I'm not actually sure the exact mechanism of how they help the drug in the PMDI get more into the lungs. The main reason that we use them is that they slow down the drug and reduce the particle size. One of the benefits of the spacer is that the larger particles that without a spacer would get deposited in your oropharynx, causing the dysphonia and the thrush, they, they fall out in the spacer. So only the three micron particles that go down to your alveoli, those get inhaled into your lungs. Interesting. So if spacers and chambers are slowing particles down and allowing smaller ones to get through, in theory, less drug should get stuck in the oropharynx and there should be less side effects like thrush. Exactly right. And another reason that we use these, and this is true for the spacers too, but even more so with the valve holding chambers, is that the patient then has a little bit more time so that they don't need to perfectly time their breath with pushing down on the canister. Sounds like a win. You attach your inhale it to one end of the space or the other end of the spacer goes in your mouth. So you can squeeze, the mist goes into the spacer. Then when you're good and ready, then you can inhale. You inhale nice and slowly, and then you hold your breath again. Okay, so let's move on to the next type of inhaler. Dry powder inhalers or DPIs. These are really common. If you've ever prescribed a discus, ellipta, or hand inhaler, or an inhaler that your patient loads with a capsule, then you've prescribed a DPI. Mm, those all sound so different. And I actually assumed they were all different devices. So I'm so glad you clarified that, Luke. Yeah, you would think. And there are some differences between brand names, but they all basically work the same way. With DPIs, the medication is stored as a powder, and then the device aerosolizes it when the patient inhales by drawing the air through the powder. Some good things going for DPIs are that you don't need to coordinate pushing anything with inhalation. You just take a puff. It's great that they don't have to coordinate pushing on the inhaler with taking a breath, but using these can be challenging for some patients because they really need to be able to generate enough negative inspiratory flow to be able to actually aerosolize the drug to get it into their lungs. So is there a good rule of thumb to know who those patients are, the patients that won't be able to generate enough inspiratory flow with a DPI? You know, I've been wondering the same thing. I asked Dr. Schwartzstein, and he said that there isn't a hard and fast rule, but that he starts to worry about DPIs when they have more severe emphysema or hyperinflation on imaging. More specifically, up to one in three patients after a COPD exacerbation have a peak inspiratory flow rate less than 60 liters per minute. So DPIs may not be optimal inhalers for them. Yeah, that's a great point. The last thing that I would just add to be aware of for the DPIs is that humidity can actually make the powder clump. So then the particle size becomes larger and then more gets deposited in the mouth rather than reaching their lungs. No buenos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they do make single dose capsules, which you'll see called a handy healer device that can help protect against humidity causing clumping. But then your patient has to be able to load the inhaler with a capsule every time they want to use it. Mm. Of course, no free lunch. No free lunch with inhalers. Exactly. All right, let's move on now to the last type of inhaler device, the soft mist inhaler or SMI. This is a newer technology that you'll see labeled as a Respimat. SMIs are devices that are shaped like tubes that work by having the patient twist part of the inhaler and then push a button that releases an aerosolized mist. Hmm, hence the soft mist name. Right, and there are some pros of SMIs because of this. First, unlike dry powdered inhalers, soft mist inhalers don't depend on your patient's inspiratory flow. Right, but the slower mist does mean that patients will still have to coordinate their breath somewhat with pressing the button, but unlike with the PMDIs, it doesn't need to be perfectly coordinated. Yeah, the mist actually moves more slowly and lasts a few seconds longer than with a PMDI, which leads to more drug in the lung and less in the oropharynx. Sounds like another win. I'm almost sold. There must be some drawbacks. It sounds too good. (laughs) You would think. 
So, you know, it's maybe not quite a drawback, but something to be aware of is that because they are newer technology, not all types of COPD medications are available in the soft mist inhaler devices. And for the same reason, they can sometimes be a bit more expensive too. Mm, Still no free lunch, huh? (laughs) One of our peer reviewers mentioned this, and I think it helped me put it into perspective. Dr. Nick Mark had said, you know, the best type of inhaler is going to be the one that the patient can actually take and afford i.e. whichever one their insurance covers, unfortunately. So with all that being said, why don't we recap some of the pros and cons of each and what we should be educating our patients on. Luke, go for it. So some big takeaways with metered dose inhalers or PMDIs include making sure your patient gets a consistent dose by shaking it before using and wasting a puff first if they haven't used it in a while. And make sure they're timing pressing down and inhaling well. This last part is where ordering a spacer or a valved holding chamber can come in handy so the drug really reaches the lung and the patient doesn't have to think so much about when they're inhaling. And then with dry powder inhalers or DPIs, these are going to be things like discus, ellipta, hand inhaler. We want to make sure the patient can generate enough breath to actually aerosolize the powder. And we want to remind them to not store it in a humid area. The real benefit to these is they don't have to time pressing down on it and timing their breath. And just as an FYI, if you're ordering a hand inhaler, the patient needs to be able to physically put a pill in every single time into the canister. And finally, soft mist inhalers can get more drug in the lungs and less in the oropharynx and also give patients slightly more time to inhale after releasing the med. The only real drawback here is that they're a bit newer, so they can be more expensive and not every drug is available in this form. Yeah, and with all of these, make sure your patient's holding their breath for 5 to 10 seconds after a puff to give them the best shot at actually getting the meds into their lungs. One last thing I would add here that we didn't mention fully before, but in addition to counseling the patient yourself, you can ask your patients to ask the pharmacist to go over it again, how to use the inhalers when they pick them up. You know, this was a very humbling blind spot for me. I didn't know that all pharmacists, not just the ones in our hospital, but retail pharmacists, all pharmacists are trained to teach our patients how to use inhalers. Yeah, you know, I think patients really appreciate hearing it from me in clinic, but then again, when they talk to their pharmacist. So utilize your interprofessional colleagues. So we diagnosed our patient, we decided what initial med they should be using, we picked an inhaler device, reviewed the technique with them, fast forward some time, they're coming back to see us in clinic. What should I do or how should I prep the patient in the follow-up visit? So Gold recommends that we repeat spirometry annually to monitor for rapid disease progression, so we should make sure that they have some way that they're plugged in to get their annual spirometry. I think the biggest one is missing their reduction in activity as a sign that they're doing fine. In other words, they come and say, I'm, I'm kind of like I was before, and, uh, you know, don't get too short of breath at home and so on and so forth. But what you have missed is they're doing less and less and less. I, I love to take my patients for a walk uh, for a couple of, for the patient's benefit and for mine. Um, they say this, uh, sitting is the new smoking. I standardize my walk. So, so I'll, and I'll make a notation in the chart, walking from the waiting room to the to the exam room. I find it very, very helpful to check oxygen saturation at rest and with walking. And if I do that every time, then I'll get a sense over time. Exactly. And also in the follow-up visits, we should really be thinking if we can titrate down or stop some meds, especially the ICS, because there are some dose-dependent risks with the inhaled steroids. One caveat about uh, inhaled corticosteroids um, is that people often get put on the highest dose or the medium dose just to try to get them feeling better, which is great. And then part of what I do is to always look for ways to reduce the inhaled corticosteroids if possible. Because over time, you do see people who develop more uh, bruising of the skin, increased risk for cataracts and glaucoma, Sometimes people, especially with diabetes, will have an elevation in their blood sugar, blood pressure will be up, all kinds of things like that. Occasionally, you'll see someone who develops actually atrogenic adrenal uh, suppression from the chronic inhaled corticosteroids. If they've been on, say, fluticasone, 500 micrograms twice a day. Wow. I am surprised to hear systemic effects of just inhaled steroids. Maybe the takeaway here is that our default shouldn't be, okay, things are going well, continue ICS. And maybe if things are going well, it should trigger us to say, okay, maybe we can de-escalate a bit. Definitely. And another time that I'm decreasing steroids is if someone is coming into my clinic and 
you know, they're having pneumonia or still having exacerbations while on an ICS, then I'm like, okay, this isn't helping. Maybe it's hurting. I really need to start down titrating this. Yeah. Just remember that when you are de-escalating an inhaled steroid, you really need to keep a close eye on your patient to see if they're going to start having more exacerbations. Yeah, definitely. And the wisdom trial in the New England Journal from 2014 also helped us understand how we can do this. So basically with patients who are on triple therapy, who you want to wean off their ICS, you should go gradually. So going from a high dose to medium to a low dose over a period of about 12 weeks to mitigate the risk of exacerbation with de-escalation. Wow. You know, you guys are talking about all this and I just can't help but feel bad. Maybe this is a huge knowledge gap issue, but you know, I think about, for example, with like heart failure meds, I get up all in there, titrating, discontinuing. That is not the case with COPD. And I think of like so many patients I could have done a better job with. Yeah. Don't feel too bad, Trey. You're definitely not alone in that. We talked a bit about ICS. Maybe there's some knowledge gaps with llamas and labas. When should I be up titrating and down titrating those? How do we change the inhaler regimen with those? Yeah, great question. So like we talked about a little bit earlier, most patients are usually started on one agent, either a llama or a lava. And so then if they're still having shortness of breath or having more exacerbations, then all you have to do is add whichever agent they aren't on. Then they'll end up on a combination llama lava. But wait a minute, Allie, with llamas and labas, you're not titrating up and down doses like we did with inhaled steroids? Nope. So with the llamas and labas, it's much simpler, actually. It's usually just one dose, unless there are new formularies coming out. So if there are symptoms aren't controlled on what they're on, all you have to do is reach for the other agent to add. Ah, uh, nice. And then, of course, if your patient has a high eosinophils and lots of exacerbations, think about adding an inhaled steroid to have them on triple therapy with llama, laba, and an ICS. This is where things can get a bit more nuanced and where we should probably involve a pulmonologist because if a patient is having lots of exacerbations, but they don't have high EOs, then they might still warrant a trial of triple therapy with inhaled steroids too. The last thing I would say is that if your patient is still short of breath and already on combo inhalers, and you've checked that they're using them correctly, you can try changing the inhaler device itself. Ah, a little switcheroo. <laughs> Whether it's placebo or it's just an like easier technique for them, I think definitely worth a try and I'm going to keep that in my back pocket next time. One last thing that comes up in follow-up visits or even in the hospital is patients will ask like, well, hey, what do you think about pulmonary rehab? And I'm like, sure, it's great if your insurance covers it. And I have to admit, I think I have a pretty superficial understanding of what pulmonary rehab actually is. Pulmonary rehab can be so helpful for many people who are limited by their breathing. So there's education, there's physical training, it's a social experience, gets people out of the house. Rehab does more than just increase your cardiovascular capacity. It also gives you strategies, personalist breathing. It gives you the confidence that when you say, oh, I'm short of breath, there's nothing like having the therapist there saying, by the way, your saturation is fine. You look fine. Pulmonary rehab is the best. <laughs> I just have to put a quick plug here because this is one of the most effective but least utilized interventions for COPD. And there was actually this meta-analysis published showing that when pulmonary rehab was started after a COPD exacerbation, these patients had better quality of life, didn't have as many readmissions. And what was crazy and what I was most impressed by is that they actually had improved mortality. Oof. Yeah, and, and a bit of a mic drop, the Cochrane Review found that it was so effective that they said in the paper, quote, it is our opinion that additional RCTs are not warranted. I don't know about y'all, but I cannot remember the last time I heard that. Uh, that is a bit snarky and bold, yeah. <laughs> All no right. more RCTs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to recap Pearl 4, get annual spirometry to track disease progression. And if you find your patient short of breath or still having exacerbations, reach for the combo LAMA and LAVA. Or triple LAMA-LAVA ICS if they're more the inflammatory phenotype or having frequent or severe exacerbations. Unlike in asthma, the overall benefits of inhaled steroids in COPD are more marginal, and the incidence of side effects is higher. So think about titrating down the inhaled steroid if they're having pneumonia, or exacerbations, or if they've been really well controlled for a long time. And last but not least, my big takeaway is to get more of our patients into pulmonary rehab. It sounds like it's just like ordering outpatient PT for patients, which I imagine has some accessibility issues, but sounds like it's definitely worth a try with mortality benefit too. Okay, I am so grateful we went over the trajectory of COPD management from initial inhalers, device choices, titration, and that's all great from like a straight up medication perspective. I guess that doesn't really mean much if we don't communicate to our patients about the lifelong illness that COPD is. 
when you break the bad news to somebody that they have COPD, you have to think about it the same as telling someone they have cancer and understanding that in that first visit, they're likely not absorbing a lot of information. And for COPD, the biggest thing for them to hear is that this is a disease that they'll have for the rest of their life. It is a disease that is going to progressively get worse over time and that we have no treatments to cure or stop the progression of the disease. And I think that's sort of the biggest thing to really make sure in those first couple of visits that people hear and understand. Because I think that's the framework on which the rest of the discussions build. And that was Dr. Rebecca Amor, a geriatrics and palliative medicine trained doctor in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. You know, I think COPD is really similar to heart failure in this, in that we don't often hear that diagnosis and immediately think of their mortality. But in both cases, you know, they come in for an exacerbation, they get treated, they get better to some extent, but their mortality is still really high. So I think in the same way that cancer sets off these mortality alarm bells, a patient being admitted with a COPD exacerbation should really get us thinking about their mortality risk. Yeah, there is a shockingly high mortality rate post-hospitalization for a COPD exacerbation. The one-year mortality ranges from 23% if admitted to the floor to 35% if they're admitted to the ICU. That is really high, Luke. I know, right? And you know, I'll be honest that even though I see these patients regularly in clinic and in the hospital, I also find those numbers shocking. And it's a great reminder that a COPD exacerbation, whether treated inpatient or outpatient, this can be a good signpost for us and a good trigger that we should talk to our patients about their goals of care. If you have someone who's never experienced a COPD exacerbation, has never been in the hospital or been in the ICU on a ventilator, then really trying to explain to them what that's like is going to be difficult, even with a picture. And so thinking that you're going to have this like really great conversation upfront about whether somebody wants to be intubated or not, it's probably not going to work out the way you're hoping it would. Yeah. One thing that can help in painting a picture for patients with the caveat that we are not great at prognosticating, and this is all just an estimate, is the Bode Index, which gives an estimate of four-year survival. Yeah. It's, you know, it's definitely not an end-all be-all, but Gold does recommend that where possible, a scoring system like Bode can be used a few months after discharge from a COPD exacerbation to help us assess the patient's prognosis. Yeah, I do find sometimes having numbers be helpful and sometimes, yeah, it does paint that picture saying like, you know, from what we know with population data, you have a 25% or 50% chance of survival after four years. And I know it's a four-year survival estimate. I'm curious, is there something else that can give us a sense of if someone's truly at the end of their life? We don't have any really good tools for people who are within six months of death. What we can try to do is get a sense of someone's functional status with their IADLs, ADLs, and that can help us guide some of these conversations. The issue in my mind is you're going to be on the ventilator forever. The issue is, will you be restored to the present level of activity that you have now? There was a study years ago in the Annals of Internal Medicine. It was a small study, 100 to 150 patients, as I remember. But they looked at people who had been on a ventilator for more than three or four days, not real long times on the ventilator, and only 10% of them got back to the level of function afterwards that they had before they had the acute illness. You know, this blew my mind. 90% of people that you have intubated will not return to their previous level of function. Now, that may be okay. They may just, you know, adapt to that new level. But it's important to say, how happy are you with your present level of function? And if you couldn't do A, B, or C, the things that you do now, is that consistent with what you view as a valuable existence for you? Is that consistent with how you live your life and what you want to do for the time that you have left? And if they say, no, if I couldn't do those three things, I'd just as soon not have you prolong my life. Okay, then. Summarizing our last pearl here. COPD is a disease with a shockingly high mortality and a really significant symptom burden. Prognosticating is hard, but we can use the Bode Index to estimate a patient's four-year survival. Advanced care planning is not a procedural yes or no question. Instead, try to understand your patient's values. In particular, ask them what is an acceptable functional status for them, knowing that things will most likely get worse. 
Thanks so much, Luke. That is a wrap for today's episode. If you found this episode helpful, please share it with your team, your colleagues, give it a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. It really does help people find us. Tweet us, leave us a comment on our website page, our Instagram, our Facebook page. And thank you to Dr. Jamie Betancourt, Dr. Nick Mark, and Dr. Lakshman Swami for reviewing this episode. Thank you also to Doc Shbatia for audio editing and to Dr. Michelle Lowe for the accompanying graphic. This episode was made as part of the digital education track at BIDMC. Thank you to all the educators and mentors for their wisdom and guidance. In particular, to Drs. Shreya Trivedi, Adam Rodman, and Chris Smith. As always, we love hearing your feedback. Email us at hello at coreimpodcast.com. Opinions expressed are our own and do not represent the opinions of any affiliated institutions. Thank you. Take care.